Hey everyone, Brian here. I've posted revision 1.3 of my book, The Fundamentals of Control Theory. Supporters can download it through the link in the description, and if you're not yet a supporter, all it takes is a donation of any amount to become one and get the book. More about that at the end of the video, but for now let's walk through the new section of the book and learn about Laplace transforms. For context, we're at the end of the chapter on transfer functions, and the new section is 2.6. This section describes the Laplace transform in what I think is an intuitive, rather than mathematical way. And the section is specifically structured to explain how Laplace transforms will be useful for understanding transfer functions. An easy way to understand Laplace is by contrasting it with the Fourier transform. But to do that properly, let's review some of the finer Fourier transform points. One thing you should remember is that the Fourier transform maps a signal from the time domain, typically a one-dimensional function of time, to the frequency domain, which is a two-dimensional function, one dimension for the magnitude and one dimension for the phase of the frequency content. We can see this by walking through a simple example. Here I just set up a simple exponential decay function whose value is zero for all negative time. The equation for this function is u of t, which is just the step function, multiplied by e to the minus t, the exponential function. Now instead of solving the Fourier transform integral, here we just get the result by looking up the answer from one of the many online transform tables. Now this may feel like cheating, but I tend to leave solving integrals to the mathematics books, so I don't make the controls concepts I'm trying to cover confusing by adding a bunch of calculus. You'll notice the result is a complex function because of the imaginary variable j. It's 1 over 1 plus j omega. Now complex functions are, by definition, two-dimensional functions, which is where our two dimensions come from. It's embedded in the real and imaginary components, which we separate out in step four. Now, if you were to plot this function across all frequencies, omega, then you'd get a real plot and an imaginary plot separately. Or you could just plot them together on a two-axis plane. And describing the result as real and imaginary is called the rectangular coordinate representation. But to turn it into magnitude and phase, we need to convert it into the polar coordinate representation, which is done here. So now you can see the idea laid out in front of you, starting from a one-dimensional exponential decay as a function of time, and ending with a two-dimensional magnitude and phase as a function of frequency, omega, where the value of omega describes the value of the frequency, as well as the location on the frequency line. Keep that in mind as we move on to the s-plane and the Laplace transforms. The Laplace transform goes one step further than the Fourier transform. In addition to cosine waves, the Laplace transform decomposes a signal into cosine waves and exponential functions. So we need a new variable that can account for both of these concepts, and that is where s comes in. s is a complex variable, so it's two-dimensional, and it contains frequency information, j omega, as well as exponential information, sigma. Let's explain how that works. If you raise e to an imaginary number, the result is a complex function consisting of sine and cosine waves, which is described through Euler's formula. So raising e to the j omega portion of the s variable produces frequency signals. On the other hand, if you raise e to a real number, positive real numbers give us exponentially growing signals, and negative real numbers give us exponentially decaying signals. In this case, we can replace the coefficient of t in the exponent with the variable sigma to get e to the sigma t. Now negative sigmas give us decaying functions, and positive sigmas give us growing functions. The larger the number, the faster they grow or decay. So what does that mean for s? Well, e to the st has an exponential component and a frequency component, so that for a given s, we can create signals that are combinations of the two. Now instead of a single dimensional number line like we had with just omega, s exists on a two-dimensional number plane, which we call the s-plane. The real dimension is sigma, and the imaginary dimension is omega. At this point, we can move on to the Laplace transform because it uses the variable s. Like I said before, let's contrast the difference between Laplace and Fourier. As you can see, the only difference is that we've replaced j omega with s. But since s is sigma plus j omega, Really, we've just added the real component sigma to the equation. We haven't actually removed anything. All right, now this is kind of cool. If we replace s with sigma plus j omega in the Laplace transform, 
and then we rearrange the equation, we find something interesting. Essentially, the Laplace transform is taking the original function of time, multiplying it by an exponential function, and then taking the Fourier transform of the result. So why is this interesting, you might ask? Well, let's go back to the s-plane and look at a very narrow strip of it, particularly when sigma equals zero. In this one case, the exponential term goes to one, since e to the zero is one, and the Laplace transform becomes exactly the Fourier transform. So when we're looking at our two graphs, magnitude and phase, we can just plot those exact same Fourier transform results on the s-plane along the sigma equals zero line. I have to take a detour to briefly explain the region of convergence, otherwise I'll get in trouble for misleading you. The Laplace transform, when sigma equals zero, only equals the Fourier transform if the sigma equals zero line is inside the region of convergence. This region is where the Laplace integral converges to a finite value, rather than summing up to infinity or just never converging at all. To understand this, let's look at the impulse response of a stable system, which decays over time, versus an unstable system, which grows over time. If we multiply the stable response by e to the minus j omega t, the signal will continue to decay, and the area under the absolute value of the curve has a finite value. Since this value is finite, this function is within the region of convergence, and the Fourier transform exists for it. However, if we multiply the unstable response by e to the minus j omega t, the signal will continue to grow, and the area under the absolute value of the curve now has infinite value. This is not within the region of convergence, and it's the reason why you can't perform the Fourier transform on an unstable system. However, this is not a problem for Laplace, because there are other regions in the s-plane that are within the region of convergence. Okay, let's get back to the regular section. So far we just have a single sliver of the s-plane filled out. We can fill out another sliver by choosing another sigma value, like sigma equals minus one, and then multiply our time function by e to the t, and take the Fourier transform of the result. But e to the t cancels out the exponential in the original function, which was e to the minus t, and we're just left with a step function u of t. Now this is a bit of a trick question here because the Fourier transform for a step function is not inside the region of convergence, but it's just barely not inside. Actually, it's right on the cusp of this region. You can see that by choosing sigma values on either side of minus one, and see that on one side it converges, and on the other side it definitely doesn't converge. So there's something special about the location in the s-plane that produced a value that was just exactly infinity. And that point is right at s equals minus one. And it's no coincidence that both our original time domain function and the interesting point in the s-plane both contain e to the minus t. That is exactly what the Laplace transform is doing. It's probing our original function with every possible s across the entire plane to see if there is anything interesting there. And we define interesting as just barely infinity or zero. Those are the two interesting points. Of course, we don't have to fill out the entire s plane one sigma at a time because the Laplace transform integral does all of those steps all at once. Also, we don't even have to plot the result at all because we can find the interesting points, which are zeros and infinities, algebraically by solving the resulting equation. And that is really cool. This is just about the end of the new section and pretty much all of the background information you need to fully understand transfer functions. In the next book release, I'll pull everything in this chapter together to provide an intuitive understanding of transfer functions and how to use them. Now, if you've supported me in the past through Konos, what are you waiting for? You can just click the link in the description and download this updated book right now for free. If you aren't a supporter and you'd like the book, then it's just like any other textbook. It costs $120. Just kidding. All you have to do is go to the link and for any amount you choose, either one time or monthly, you can download this book and then all future releases um, from, that, from that point on. And if you want the book, but you really don't want to give me any money, then you could just get a copy from one of your friends. I'm releasing it under a Creative Commons license, so you are more than welcome to share the book with as many people as you like. 
My hope is that it spreads to all engineering students and through everyone's collective comments and questions, I can create something that is truly helpful to learn the subject. Thanks for the support and stay tuned for more book updates.